3309, the Innovation Act. The enactment of this bill is something I consider central to U.S. competitiveness, job creation, and our nation's future economic security. This bill takes meaningful steps to address the abusive practices that have damaged our patent system and resulted in significant economic harm to our nation. During the last Congress, we passed the America Invents Act. Many view the AIA as the most comprehensive overhaul to our patent system since the 1836 Patent Act. However, the AIA was, in many respects, a prospective bill. The problems that the Innovation Act will solve are more immediate and go to the heart of current abusive patent litigation practices. This bill builds on our efforts over the past decade. It can be said that this bill is the product of years of work. We have worked with members of both parties in both the Senate and the House, with stakeholders from all areas of our economy, and with the administration and the courts. To ensure an open, deliberative, and thoughtful process, we held hearings and issued two public discussion drafts in May and September of this year, which led to the formal our economy. Everyone from independent inventors to startups to mid- and large-sized businesses face this constant threat. The tens of billions of dollars spent on settlements and litigation expenses associated with abusive patent suits represent truly wasted capital. Wasted capital that could have been used to create new jobs, fund research and development, and create new innovations and technologies that promote the progress of science and useful arts. Within the past couple of years, we have seen an exponential increase in the use of weak or poorly granted patents to send out purposely evasive blanket demand letters or file numerous patent infringement lawsuits against American businesses with the hopes of securing a quick payday. Many of these abusive practices are focused not just on larger companies, but against small and medium-sized businesses as well. These suits target a settlement just under what it would cost for litigation, knowing that these businesses will want to avoid costly litigation and probably pay up. Such abusive patent suits claim ownership over basic ideas, such as sending a photocopy to email, aggregating news articles, offering free Wi-Fi in your shop, or using a shopping cart on your website. Something is terribly wrong here. The patent system was never intended to be a playground for litigation extortion or frivolous claims. One egregious example is of a company that has been suing small app developers and end users over a vaguely worded patent that claims that any app that allows for in-app purchases violates their patent. This early 90s patent apparently discusses a method for providing remote customer feedback using a fax machine. Though their patent made months when they sent Martha Stewart a demand letter asking for $5,000 for each of her company's four apps. Instead of paying up, Ms. Stewart filed a declaratory judgment action in federal court in Wisconsin. Fortunately, Ms. Stewart chose to fight. Unfortunately, many small businesses simply do not have the resources to do so and must capitulate to this type of patent extortion. The Innovation Act contains needed reforms to address the issues that businesses of all, all sizes and industries face from patent troll type behavior while keeping in mind several key principles, including targeting abusive behavior rather than specific entities, preserving valid patent enforcement tools, preserving patent property rights, promoting invention by independents and small businesses, and strengthening the overall patent system. Congress, the federal courts, and the PTO must take the necessary steps to ensure that the patent system lives up to its constitutional underpinnings. And let me be clear about Congress's constitutional authority in this area. The Constitution grants Congress the power to create the federal courts, and the Supreme Court has long recognized that the, prescriptive, the prescription of court procedures falls within the legislative function. To that end, the Innovation Act includes heightened pleading standards and transparency provisions, requiring parties to do a bit of due diligence up front before filing an infringement suit is just plain common sense. If not, it not only reduces litigation expenses, but saves the courts time and resources. Greater transparency and information makes our patent system stronger. The Innovation Act also provides for more clarity surrounding initial discovery, case management, joinder, and the common law doctrine of customer stays. 
the bill's provisions are designed to work hand in hand with the procedures and practices of the judicial conference including the rules enabling act and the courts providing them with clear policy guidance while ensuring that we are not pre determining outcomes and at the final rules and the legislation's implementation in the courts will be both deliberative and effective we can take steps toward eliminating the abuses of our patent system discouraging frivolous patent litigation and keeping u s patent laws up to date doing so will help fuel the engine of american innovation and creativity creating new jobs and growing our economy i look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses on the innovation act and the issue of abusive patent litigation and it's now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member the gentleman from michigan mr conyers for his opening statement thank you chairman good luck members of the committee there are few economic issues our committee will face that are more important than whether and how to reform our patent laws intellectual property principally patents are responsible for nearly one third of all the jobs in the u s economy our patent system while not perfect is the envy of the world and perhaps the most significant driver of growth in our economy i believe that issues of non practicing entities or the so called patent trolls present unique problems that are worthy of congressional attention there is a disconnect when shell corporations with little or no assets can threaten thousands of small end users with ill conceived patent litigation over ordinary business practices if we don't know who the shell companies are if the shell companies have no operating businesses or assets and if they are given free license to engage in endless and cost lead discovery we have a problem that requires our attention and legislation but at the same time we need to be careful in addressing these problems our first rule should be to make sure we do no harm to our patent system or take any actions which unintentionally discourage innovation or increase litigation as the former director of patent and trademark office david capos reminds us we are not just tinkering with any system here we're reworking the greatest innovation engine the world has ever known almost instantly after it has been significantly overhauled if there were ever a case where caution is called for this is it and in this regard i don't see any reason why we should be considering amending the fee shifting statute when the supreme court has just agreed to take up the very issue similarly i see no rush to expand the use of business method patents when the p t o and the courts are just now beginning to review cases brought under the law we just passed any changes we make must be carefully balanced and consistent with our principles and constitutional imperatives for 80 years we've asked our federal judges the experts on litigation to develop rules for their own court rooms that system has worked well and i see no reason to abrogate the principle of separation of powers now and if we're going to consider crafting new rules on discovery stays and joinder we should insist that the rules work the same for all parties plaintiffs and defendants nor should we be crafting a series of special carve outs from the legislation for the pharmaceutical industry the last thing we need to do is to create two systems of patent law one for the pharmaceuticals and one for everybody else we cannot lose sight of the single most important problem to me that's facing our patent system today the continuing diversion of patent fees the most effective step we can take in responding to abusive patent litigation is making sure poor quality patents are not issued to begin with 
to do that we need to give our examiners the resources they need to review and analyze the hundreds of thousands of complex and interrelated patent applications they they receive every year and that's why yesterday along with my colleagues representatives watt and i said collin we've introduced bipartisan legislation the innovation protection act which does exactly that on a permanent and statutory basis this will apply regardless of the sequester or any future shutdowns and i stand ready able and willing to work with members on both sides of the aisle in tackling these problems but i would urge my friend the chairman to move cautiously carefully and deliberately and i thank you for the opportunity to deliver my statement well thank you mr conyers and we'll now turn to the chairman of the subcommittee on courts intellectual property and the internet mr coble of north carolina for his opening statement I thank the chairman. Good morning. Good morning to our panelists and those in the audience. Mr. Chairman, today we're here to build on our work to ensure that the U.S. patent system operates fairly for all parties in the context of litigation and in our courts. Abusive patent litigation is a scourge. It is the product of those taking advantage of loopholes in the current system to engage in what amounts to litigation extortion. H.R. 3309, the Innovation Act, builds on the work of the, of the Leahy Smith America Events Act, the AIA, of 2011 and previous Congresses. The AIA was the most substantial reform to U.S. patent law since the 1836 Patent Act. While the AIA rewrote the underlying patent law and procedure at the PTO, the dramatic rise in abusive patent litigation over the last several years necessitates our work to address patent litigation reform measures. I call on my fellow members and stakeholders, Mr. Chairman, to continue working with us in a thoughtful and deliberative manner as we address abusive patent litigation. The rules that we put into place address some of the most abusive patent practices but will apply to all patents, and so it is important that we work collaboratively with the administration and the Senate to ensure that similarly to the AIA, we are enacting meaningful reforms that set patent litigation on the right track for dec decades to come. American innovation cannot be held hostage to frivolous lit litigation from weak or overblown patents. Companies are shutting down and folks are losing jobs. To ensure that the American economy does not suffer due to legal gamesmanship, that is currently taking place, enacting the, the Innovation Act, in my opinion, will be vital. I hope to hear more today from our witnesses on the steps that need to be taken to promote America's innovation economy and create jobs. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling the hearing, and I yield back. Chair, thanks the gentleman, and is now pleased to recognize the Ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Watt, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman Goodlad, and let me join with you in congratulating our colleague, Mr. Conyers, on his historic accomplishment today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to thank and welcome all the witnesses, and especially to welcome back the former Undersecretary of Commer for Commerce and Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, Dave Kappos. Um, He's been a tremendously valuable resource to me, my staff, and other members of the Intellectual Property Subcommittee and this full committee. And I want to thank him for his continued generosity of time and expertise. I supported the America Invents Act and actively participated in its development through bipartisan member meetings as well as joint meetings with stakeholders and administration officials. The reforms enacted in the America Invents Act were designed to equip the PTO to deliver better quality and more efficient services to the innovative Americans who rely upon the office to evaluate and process their patent claims fairly. 
The USPTO is ground zero in our efforts to maintain a world-class patent system. But in order to protect our innovators from false reliance on bad patents, costly litigation in the federal courts, services that are not commensurate with the fees they pay, and a full range of other negative things, we must find the political courage to fully fund the PTO. That is why I was happy to join with Mr. Conyers and my Republican colleagues, Mr. Collins and Mr. Issa, in introducing the Innovation Protection Act, guaranteeing that our inventors, whether large or small, whether individuals, businesses, or universities, get the services they pay for is not a complicated proposition. Congress has studied and acknowledged the adverse effects of depriving the PTO of needed resources for years. It's good policy with virtually universal support and the time to deliver is overdue and I hope that all members of this committee will join as co-sponsors of our bill and that this committee will act on our legislation promptly. The problem we confront with the so-called patent trolls, while real, is not, in my opinion, nearly as enormous as it has been portrayed, nor as urgent. The GAO dutifully fulfilled this mandate to assess the consequences of patent litigation by non-practicing entities. Um, the takeaway from that study was that operating companies fight more among themselves and bought the bulk of the patent lawsuits examined over a period of years, and that the non-practicing entities bought only a fraction of cases but engage in litigation tactics that pose some unique challenges. These unique challenges can undoubtedly require equally unique uh, will undoubtedly require u equally unique solutions, not solutions that could have an adverse impact on all litigants. While the chairman's, chairman's bill proposes a number of creative solutions, we need to carefully examine how they will affect not only the bad actors, but how they will affect all participants in the patent system. And while the chairman released two discussion drafts prior to introducing his bill to date the process of developing and testing these legislative proposals has been, quite frankly, both insular and disappointing. While I support some of the concepts in H.R. 3309, I worry about the interaction and execution of some of its particular provisions and question the wisdom of others. In the meantime, we risk jeopardizing comity with the federal judiciary, judiciary with overly pro prescriptive mandates, losing the trust and confidence of the small and independent innovators with unbalanced remedies that leave them out of the equation. And even worse, we run the risk of enacting measures that could not only be ineffective but could exacerbate the current problem or invite new unintended problems. One need only look to the joinder provisions incorporated at the 11th hour in the American Invents Act. These joinder provisions were intended to disrupt the practice of joining unrelated defendants in a single case. In that respect, the joinder rules were successful but the unintended, yet upon reflection, not entirely unpredictable consequence has been an explosion of litigation against single defendants. There are multiple credible and thoughtful stakeholders who have expressed grave reservations about one provision or another in the chairman's bill. These concerns should not be dismissed as opposition or obstructionism. Reflection is much needed here, and I hope that moving forward here, will, uh, there will be in-depth, constructive, and, and open reflection and engagement. We have spent a considerable amount of time in various hearings discussing, even arguing about the problem. I urge the chairman to devote at least a comparable amount of time to evaluating 
these very discreet and unrelated proposed solutions. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses and yield back. The Chair thanks the gentleman. Without objection, all other members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. We welcome our panel today, and if you would all rise, I will begin by swearing in the witnesses. Do you and each of you swear that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses responded in the affirmative, and I'll begin by introducing them. Our first witness is Mr. Krish Gupta, Senior Vice President and Deputy General Counsel of EMC Corporation. In his position, Mr. Gupta manages a worldwide portfolio of IP and technology licensing, including patent and trademark prosecution and IP litigation. Prior to his position at EMC, he served 10 years as Senior <coughs> Counsel at Digital Equipment Corporation. He is a registered patent attorney and currently serves on the Board of Directors at the Intellectual Property Owners Association and at the Association of Corporate Counsel Northeast Chapter. Mr. Gupta received his JD from Suffolk University Law School, MBA from the University of South Carolina, Columbia, MS in Electrical Engineering from Clemson University, and his bachelor's degree from the Birla Institute of Technology and Science. Our second witness is Mr. Kevin Kramer. Mr. Kramer is Vice President and Deputy General Counsel for Intellectual Property at Yahoo, where he is responsible for all intellectual property matters, including the defense of the company in patent infringement cases. Prior to joining Yahoo, Kevin was a partner at the law firm Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman, representing both plaintiffs and defendants in a wide range of patent litigation. Kevin has also extensive government and international experience. He worked for several years as an associate solicitor for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. In that capacity, he represented the USPTO in more than 20 direct appeals before the U.S. Court of Appeals <coughs> for the Federal Circuit and in numerous civil actions before the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. Kevin also worked for several years as a legal officer in the Patent Cooperation Treaty Legal Division of the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. Our third witness is the Honorable David Kapos. We welcome Mr. Kapos' return in front of this committee. He served as the Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office from August 2009 to January 2013. He is currently a partner in the law firm of Kravitz, Swain, and Moore. Before joining the PTO, Mr. Kapos led the Intellectual Property Law Department at IBM, serving as Vice President and Assistant General Counsel for IP. During his more than 25 years at IBM, he served in a variety of roles, including Litigation Counsel and Asia-Pacific IP Counsel, based in Tokyo, Japan, where he led all aspects of IP protection activity for the Asia-Pacific region. Mr. Kapos received his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering in electrical and computer engineering from the University of California at Davis in 1983 and his law degree from the University of California, Berkeley in 1990. Our fourth witness is Mr. Robert Armitage. Over the past several decades, Mr. Armitage has been an active participant in formulating patent policy in the U.S. and abroad, and we are very happy to bring, be bringing him back out of retirement for the day to testify in front of the committee. Mr. Armitage previously served as Senior Vice President and General Counsel of Eli Lilly and Company. Prior to this, he served as Chief Intellectual Property Counsel for the Upjohn Company and was a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Vinson and Elkins LLP. Mr. Armitage has served as a past president of the American Intellectual Property Law Association and the Association of Corporate Patent Counsel. Mr. Armitage received his bachelor's degree in physics and mathematics from Albion College and his master's degree and law degree from the University of Michigan. Welcome to all of you and we'll begin with Mr. Gupta uh, and let me uh, say that each of your uh, written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety and we ask that you limit your uh, testimony to a summary in five minutes or less. To help you stay within that time, there's a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you will have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals that the witness's five minutes have expired. Uh, Mr. Gupta, welcome. Would you pull the microphone closer and be sure it's turned on? 
No. <laughs> Still not good. May need to switch microphones with Mr. Kramer. need a little innovation with our tech system, Mr. Chairman. Yes, indeed. 